towards the end, of course, we will talk about the many resources that Alzheimer's has and it's how we can help other people. So I think it's time to begin. So one of the things that we're going to talk about is care planning. The diagnosis of Alzheimer's introduces something new into whatever future plans we have. Reassess the plans and make new ones if you have to. Make adjustments to cover whatever care that is going to be needed later. Now, one of the things that we have to do may be difficult, but review your finances with a professional. Even though you may have done it before, you know, it's a little bit different now that you have this diagnosis. So while you can review your finances with a professional, consider potential costs as the disease progresses. You know, take a look at, are you, you know, might need in-home care or adult daycare or even residential care. And you need to know, looking at your finances, what you would be able to afford. So what are the resources that we might have? Well, insurance, different kinds of insurance. Um, retirement benefits. Many companies have retirement benefits and it's important to know if your particular company does. What about your personal savings and assets? Are you on any government assistance programs? You know, things like Medicaid, Medicare, and of course the VA, which has so many different resources. Now, let's talk about advanced directives. Advanced directors relate directly to the health care and to the finances. We need to have a living will, you know, expressing what you want when you no longer can express. And we need to have those powers of attorney that when you are no longer able to make your own financial decisions, you have appointed someone whom you, um, you know, have confidence in. And the same, same thing with healthcare decisions. You want to have discussed what you want and the person that you've appointed will carry that out. Now, estate planning. Well, there are other living documents that uh, you need to have, like that living trust and that will. And let's hear about Lisa. She has a diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. so. We'll hear her perspective on the legal aspect. Oh, I have all my, what we call ducks in a row. I've done my living will. I've done my regular will, advanced directives. Do it while you can still make those decisions. Do it while you could still, you know, help someone that if they're a little further advanced, if, you, if you're a caregiver, you can help know what they want. And it's sometimes people in this country today don't want to talk about death or dying or anything like that. It's a part of life. And, and, and let's make it like the circle of life. In other words, you know, death and dying is not necessarily a terrible thing. We're all going to do it. It's how we do it. And if we make our decisions properly, when we can still make good decisions, um, that makes a difference. And the point she brings out is so true. We all should make plans while we are able. Um, and certainly uh, my personal recommendation is you need to update them at different stages of your life. You know, when you're young, you have certain wants and needs. Uh, as you have kids, as they get older, you know, these are things that need to constantly be uh, reviewed. But we should make those plans while we are able to express what we want. So what do we have to do? Well, it's really good to find an elder law attorney that specializes in issues such as disability planning, guardianship, probate, and estate planning. Uh, you want to talk about guardianship. Well, you know, let's talk about kids. Who's going to be their guardian if something happens? Or if you're alone and someone has to make decisions. You need to find out and discuss and arrange probate and estate planning. You know, decide ahead of time who you want to have what, 
um, make it clear so there's no problem after your passing. Make sure to discuss healthcare decision making and financial decision making. And you know, when you talk about it with your lawyer, you really also need to have talked about it with those family members or friends that you have uh, that you want to designate to be able to make decisions. And let's talk about long term care coverage. You know, some people do have long term care. Uh, I don't know if as many now as they did when it first came out, but long-term coverage does help to pay costs. Again, we'll all look at things like uh, disability insurance if you were working and because of your diagnosis, you can't. Let's hear about, let's hear from Eve and about her husband. We had done a number of things uh, probably 20 years ago, uh, having a trust, filling out wills, having powers of attorney, those kinds of things that one sort of does. And that was sort of another shock to me. I came here and I thought, we don't have an attorney here. Uh, I've got all this stuff, it's under Ohio law. And all these things are different if you're in a different state. So I found myself a wonderful elder law attorney. And one of the first things she said to me is who, and I told her that I wanted to be my husband's power of attorney, uh, which I am now. And that was an easy thing to do. But then she said to me, who is your power of attorney? And I said, well, my husband, because you know, you're know you're in denial through all of this, even though you think you're, you're with it, you're still in denial. And she said, uh-uh, he can't be your power of attorney. Right, and a lot of people don't think about that. And they certainly need to think about that. Well, okay, if he can't do it, who am I gonna designate? And, you know, make that clear when you're making up your different plans. Safety. Oh, my gosh. Safety is so important. And so many things to think of. They change as time goes on. One of the things that we need to really look at is medication, medication assistance. You know, what can they do? What, uh, what should somebody else do? So with medication, just want to mention, you know, it depends if you're at home, if you're in an assisted living type facility as to who is distributing medicine. One of the things I've seen personally in, in the care of people is everyone's got the big long strips, you know, that you put your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or your morning, afternoon, and evening. And I would go around and check to, you know, see if they've taken their medication. And we've made a big assumption that they know if it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, you'd look in and you'd see skips of days. And, you know, it really does become a safety concern. A home safety. Let's talk about all the things at home. Don't you like that the a little knob that's on your stove? How many times you take a pot, hopefully off, or maybe leave it on, and so is the uh, stove. And of course, we know that can lead to fire. So we need to be really uh, aware. Uh, if you are living with the person or the person your loved one has a, a caretaker, take them off. You know, you, they slip on and off really easy. And this way you don't have to worry, but it certainly is something that you need to be aware of and check, right? So other safety issues that happen as the disease progresses is people become disoriented. You know, they really don't know, where am I? They, they don't know where they are. They don't recognize a person that maybe lives with them. Are they, if you leave the house, you know, if they just have the ability to open the door and leave, very easily do they get confused as to which direction, where do I live? It's certainly something that we have to watch and handle if uh, we find a person disoriented. And it's so common. We've had a family member with dementia and it was a Thanksgiving last year. And she all of a sudden just looked around and she went, where am I? She had no idea. How did I get here? She, you know, it just had no idea. Okay, Gary, let's hear what Gary has to say. There's a bracelet that, that you can wear that is a, um, a medical alert bracelet, safe return bracelet. And um, the we want to make everybody aware of this. Um, 
it, it it's not um, it's not free. Uh, I think we pay twenty five dollars a year. My wife wear, wears one also for me. Um, but the bracelet has my name on there. It has um, some mine is memory impaired and I have an eye problem and I'm allergic to Darvon. Don't ever give me Darvon. But then at the bottom of it, there's a set of numbers. And at the top of it, there's an 800 number. They can call that 800 number 24 hours, seven days a week. Should I become lost or whatever? And the policeman, you know, can I help you? I can show him the bracelet. He can call that number. They will tell them where I live, get me home safely. And uh, they'll even tell them my medical history. Now, my wife wears one. So if, Lord forbid, if she's ever in an accident or something happens and she's away from the house, her bracelet says, I have a loved one at home that has Alzheimer's. So that would alert them that they need to come and check on me. And, you know, a point a lot of people don't think about is having a, a bracelet on the other spouse, or the other loved one. Uh, so you can have that cross uh, communication. So for maintaining, and it really does help maintain independence, you can have this medic alert plus the Alzheimer's safe return. And in whatever town you live in or county, see what they have as well, you know, what type of programs. Uh, and it's really good to talk to your police and ambulance uh, that, and you tell them that you have a person with dementia or Alzheimer's. So, you know, if they encounter someone or your loved one, they are very aware of the situation. Safety issues with driving. All right, well, some signs that maybe we shouldn't be driving. We become lost while driving. We make navigation errors. You make slow or poor decisions. You know, your reflexes are much slower. So the decisions really become very slow or, or not good decisions. And you become confused about signs or how the car is operated. So let's plan ahead. In the early stage, persons with dementia often can still drive, communicate openly about what to do when driving is no longer possible. And, you know, certainly they can drive in the beginning. You certainly need to be aware when that becomes unsafe. Research other methods of transportation. And this is really something, if the decision is made, that the person cannot drive anymore. Don't just take the car away or say you can't drive anymore. Well, here's some alternatives to get to the places you like. Uh, there's a town or county uh, senior bus. There's uh, your friends go to the community center. One of them can pick you up. Here's a Uber number. You know, they there's alternatives. And so you take away, but then you give them options. And, you know, just always watch for unsafe signs of driving. Let's hear about Amos, Beverly's husband. Amos did not decide to stop driving until he got really, really lost. The doctor had been saying to him over and over again, you need to stop driving. And he would agree with her in the office. And as soon as we walked out the door, he said, she doesn't know what she's talking about. I can drive if I want to. It's got real macho on me. And I said, well, you're not driving my car. I'm sorry. Well, I can drive my car. Okay. Well, I sold his car. <laughs> so he would have to drive my car. Well, he was not very happy, but that was the only way he'd get around. And of course, what happens is for some reason, men don't seem to have the same support system so no one would pick him up to go golfing and he wouldn't call them because he didn't want them to know that he couldn't remember how to get to the golf course so one day i did let him use my car to go to the golf course he went down to 131st and halstead from country club hills he called me on my cell phone it was re it was when he could remember a phone number on his cell, it's real scary now, on his cell, he called me and says, I can't find my way home. You know, at least he called. So many people just don't, they don't want to, they're embarrassed. 
Um, but this certainly is a, a very, very common situation. So let's take a look at our total care team. I always want to remind people, you're not alone. This is not something you have to go through alone. We have different teams and you can create your different teams. Of course, you start out with the person uh, that has Alzheimer's and dementia and the care partner. And we notice we say partner because that's what you are, a partner. You're not a caregiver yet, or you don't have a caregiver, you're a partner. Then you expand that team with family, friends, and work. And the people that uh, are close to you, that you can talk to, that will you know, be a part of your everyday still. Then we expand even more into the healthcare community. And that's where you have all of your professionals, your doctors, your nurses, your, your pharmacists and other people providing that healthcare to you. And then finally, there are community resources out there. Again, you're not alone. Look at your county resources. Uh, certainly always the all-timer resources. Right? So you're not just a person by yourself. You've got all of these teams to be a part. Words from a care partner. I need my mom to talk about what's happening to my mom. That really hit home. Stress. Stress and care partners. You know, it's a lot of stress. All of a sudden, your role has changed and you are now providing care for a loved one. We go through different stages. Denial. Ah, this isn't happening. This is a mistake. Anger. You know, then we want to withdraw. Then we have anxiety, depression. Exhaustion is really a sign of stress. Sleeplessness, uh, many a night. You know, people toss and turn and they can't turn their mind off irritability, which comes from not sleeping and all those other things. Lack of concentration. It's like you just can't focus on, you know, one thing at a time. You're all over the place. And your own physical health. And that's something we don't want to happen. So any and all of these things are stress. And it's so common to happen in care partners. You need a, a outlet yourself. All right. So again, let's hear from Beverly. I have people that I can call, whether it's my support group at church or my family members. I can call and talk to my sister. I can call and talk to my daughter. I can call and talk to uh, someone from the church. So that's how I, how I really cope. The other way I cope is that I spend time for myself. I schedule a time for myself at least once a week where I don't have to do anything for anybody else but for Beverly. And what do you do with that time? Sometimes I read. Sometimes I will watch a movie. Uh, every month, every four weeks, I go for a massage, one hour massage. No cell phone on, no phone calls, no nothing. So I get my massage twice a year. I go to a spa. And once every other year, I go on a cruise. Right. She definitely takes care of herself. And that is so important. Um, she said one thing about, you know, joining her support group. Support groups are so important. There are different types of support groups, those for the care partner, those for the person with Alzheimer's, early onset, you know, join a support group. I can't say it enough. Uh, I do facilitate many different ones and things I love to hear and see is, first of all, they come away going, I'm not alone. They understand it's priceless and that's why it's so important. And so, you know, contact one. The Alzheimer's Association can certainly tell you in your area uh, what's there. And of course, many are virtual since the pandemic. So what else can you do? Like Beverly does, care for yourself. Schedule time for yourself. Listen to your body. I always say that. Your body is telling you something. You just have to pick up the sign. See your doctor. Do some kind of exercise. 
eat right. That's probably one of the hardest things for people to do is to eat right. You know, instead of just you're hungry, you pick something up. Not very healthy usually. Stay connected. Those people in your teams, especially your family and friends, stay connected. You know, call them, do a FaceTime, arrange to get together for coffee, but stay connected. If you have a hobby, maintain that hobby or try a new hobby. You don't have to be perfect, right? Just do what you like. Take a break. It's okay. You don't have to be there 24 hours, seven days a week. You have to take care of yourself because no one else will take care of you and get that support. It's so important. Words from a care partner. When this first happened, I thought we would never be happy again. Now I know that life is not over for us. Joy every day. So let's hear from Josie. Her husband, Alan, has that diagnosis of Alzheimer's. Okay, Josie. Getting the diagnosis is just, it's devastating. It's so... Um, I remember feeling when they were, when they were saying that they were pretty sure it was Alzheimer's, I got the feeling that I was standing on the edge, on the rim of a huge black hole and I was going to be falling into this hole. That, that was how I visualized how I was feeling. And, um, it has been slow, but I have discovered that that's not true. And I would encourage other people to know that there is there is life after Alzheimer's, after the diagnosis. And um, though it's difficult to become involved in the Alzheimer's Association because they have a lot of resources, they have a lot to give, and um, and you just have to reinvent your life. You, you may not have the same life that you had before, but you can reinvent it. And it may be richer than the life that you, that you already know about. And I would encourage people to get involved and to, um, and to find a support group because it, it helps to talk to other people that are in the same situation. Um, I think um, it's expected, to, to expect anyway, that um, a lot of friends will slowly drop off your radar, as Alan would say. Um, but you gain new friends. And um, life, I think, has become richer because you don't take things for granted. And um, uh, Right now, we're so fortunate. Alan is is um, still at the early stages, so I don't know what what lies ahead. Um, so I can't speak on that. But for this, for the early stage anyway, um, it's not that bad. I, you just have to, like I said, reinvent your life and and get involved. And there's a whole world out there that's um, waiting to be lived. She said it perfectly. It's not the end. You just have to reinvent, look for what is out there. What can you and your loved one do together? And there are many things you just have to refocus. Instead of looking, uh, you know, one year, five year, 10 years, you know, you like narrow it down to today. What are we going to do today? What, what are we going to make be happy about, smile about, laugh about? And, you know, it's so important uh, to be able to do that. So we've talked about all the resources that are out there. I will go certainly through some of these and then we'll be able to have questions. So ALZ.org, right? That's the website. There is so much information on this website. You know, you can spend hours really going through all the different parts. Now there's the Alzheimer's Navigator, and that's really what it does. It helps to find the community resources, the healthcare resources, it helps to navigate you in your journey. Then we have our community resource finder. There's so many different 
resources that an area has. You want to know what's in your area. When you call the 800 number, you simply give them your um, zip code and they will research everything. And of course, go to your counties. All your counties are you know, filled with resources. Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiver Center. And I see up here in Manchester, um, there is a center. Um, Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiver Center. It's so much information that can help. Uh, safety, I talked about safety before. There's a number of things that you can do. You can certainly sign up for the Alzheimer's Safe Passage. They have safety lists, like what you should look for uh, in your home. Doors that, you know, you want to make sure you know if they're open. Uh, what can you do? Your stove and on and on. 24-7 helpline, please make sure you have that number. ALZ.org, find us. Now, if you're looking for support groups or educational programs like this, again, you know, with your zip code, uh, you can have Alzheimer's help you. You can go online yourself and, and look for the closest support groups. Now, in person, of course, people look for close, but there are a lot that are virtual. And so it doesn't matter where you are. I have, I live in North Jersey, but I have a great deal of programs and groups down in South Jersey. So let's see, training, there's educational programs online, just like this. So they tell me a lot of the ones we do are online. So they're free, take advantage, you know, read them. I really do encourage everyone in some way to get involved. Support public libraries. Like, share, and subscribe for more great videos.